don't want to miss. And you guys are in the next to last nightlife that we will have here at TLC. Next week, next Wednesday, will be the last Wednesday night nightlife. Starting, uh, I believe it's January the 8th. Uh, we, will, we will not have two uh, Wednesday night service rather at Christmas uh, or New Year's Eve, uh, New Year's Day. New Year's Eve we'll have a, a social next door. That'll be great. And then starting January the 8th, we start midweek. Midweek educational night. We'll have two classes. Looks like right now about uh, a third of the people that have voiced their opinions wanted uh, biblical studies and about two-thirds are uh, voting for Christian living. So that'll be next door. Uh, Christian living will be in the banquet hall. That'll be set up. And then the uh, biblical studies will be in the library uh, room next door. And so that's going to be a great time starting January, Wednesday night, January the 8th. So there will be no service, no kind of uh, going-ons here in the sanctuary. And so uh, we're excited about what 2020 holds for a lot of areas of TLC, but that also includes our midweek Wednesday night uh, classes. That's going to be exciting. So tonight we are starting our second installment of Dollars and Cents. Dollars and Cents. And I've been talking about Dollars and Cents with our insurance company. And uh, they are coming out tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I'm meeting the adjuster. He's driving all the way from Plano. I said, good, you got to burn a lot of gas. I'm glad you have to burn a lot of gas to get down here to Joshua. To get my money back out of our $10,000 uh, uh, deductible that we have. So anyway, but uh, meeting them out here and, uh, and we're working through, working through all of that. And uh, so hopefully uh, we've got equipment coming in, I believe, uh, end of this week and beginning of next week. I think Monday or Tuesday we should get the projection systems back up and running and uh, some more of the light fixtures and things. So piecing it all together, we appreciate y'all's patience as we work through that. Tonight we're going to talk about money management. Money management at a very high level, understanding that each one of these topics that we're covering, though that I'm kind of just touching on in three weeks, uh, you could do several several weeks on each one of them in deep dives, and we'll, we'll be offering a, uh, a financial session uh, in our midweek. Coming in 2020, we'll have eight-week sessions. it will be two months, and they'll rotate topics, in both in biblical studies and in Christian living. And one of those will be uh, some type of biblical approach to finance. So you'll get more of a deep dive uh, next year when we do the financial series. But just as a reminder, last week, we kind of introduced the series and we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of money. It's not money itself. And then uh, Paul went ahead and said, And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. We all know people that have all kinds of sorrows in their pursuit of money. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we mentioned this last week. We pointed out the fact that, that money has power. And that's one reason we need to understand finances and what the Bible says about money. Because the three points we made last week, the power of money is so powerful that the, des the desire for it or the love of it brings forth all kinds of evil, the scripture tells us. And what we just read in Matthew, that our heart follows our money. And then we also read last week that God placed manna or money on a comparison scale with himself. The only thing in scripture that was ever compared to God was money. And then lastly, we mentioned last week that none of our wealth, none of our money belongs to us. It all comes from God and we simply manage it as long as we're here, uh, or stewards of it, as long as we're here on earth. Amen. So with that, all that kind of a recap from last week, power of money, and why we need to understand it and all this. So this week, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about what does money management really mean to us? And again, a 50,000 foot view. Two biggest problems in finances, in my opinion, is perception and work ethic. When it comes to people, how they manage their money, 
two biggest problems you see in society today is perception, people's perception, and people's work ethic. On the perception side of things, you see, society people have an inability to differentiate between luxury items and basic needs. They do. They call luxury items things that they need. So, there's a luxury item laying right up here that most people think is a basic need. That's one of these gadgets. Nobody needs one of these things. Because if you rewind about 12, 15 years, nobody had one of these things. Maybe 20. Like I think I read on Facebook the other day, it said, you know, isn't it odd how how 20, uh, to the year 2000 was 20 years ago, but also 1980 was 20 years ago. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's me right there, right? 1980 happened 20 years ago, not 39 years ago. My math's always off. But, but 20, 30 years ago, nobody had one of these things, right? And they also make these things that, that instead of looking like this, they flip open. They still make those. I actually looked on the website. They still make them. And you know what? Those things are just as, as, good for making get in contact with somebody is one of these things and they don't cost a thousand dollars like one of these things do right i don't have one up here with me but i wish i had uh, uh my, a remote control because some people think that cable television or satellite is a basic necessity in life that's a luxury item cell phones are luxury items cable tv are luxury items the Golden Arches or Outback or whatever your favorite restaurant is. That's a luxury item. I'm going to referencing Dave Ramsey a lot. Dave Ramsey says, you know what? When you're working through getting out of debt, you shouldn't see the inside of a restaurant unless you work there. <laughs> right? And that's so true. And I, I could have, I don't have one. I could have a little, a little cup right here with a little green circle on the front of it. People think that little cup there with the lady with the hands flailing out, they think, oh, we're not streaming, are we? I can just, oh, here we are streaming. <laughs> Careful what I said. Anyway, people think that that is a requirement, right? Now, that drug in there called caffeine is a requirement to act right, but the, the $6 version of it, the little green circle, that's not a needed item. That is a luxury item. Now I'm going to really hit home. Watch this. High-end, nice cars that are loaded out with all the bells and whistles. That's a luxury item. We need transportation. We need basic transportation. But I know that when my dad was starting out, he got from point A to point B on a, on a bicycle, then a moped. Right? You can get a car for really cheap. I won't go, I won't go down that road. I'll, I'll, I'll come back later. We'll talk about some of this next week too. But it's our perception. Our perception in reality in, 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 in today's society is, well, this is this is something I need. I need this. I need this. No, you don't. All your friends have it, and you really want it. And it's a luxury item that you think is a basic necessity because of the culture that we live in today. The other problem that we see when it comes to people's finances is work ethic. It's work ethic. People's unwillingness to work multiple jobs. I'm going to be doing a lot of staring straight ahead tonight. You looking at me, Pastor? No, I look at the clock. I'm watching my time right back there. But that's the problem. People get bad, make bad financial decisions and try to dig their way out of a financial mess and they're not willing to work a second job. Wow. Do you know that, and I'm going to use some personal stories tonight because I've made a lot of financial messes and mistakes in my life. Thankfully, my sweetheart had a lot of great sense and was a great position. We got married and helped me out a lot. But before we got married, I made a lot of stupid mistakes. But do you know not too many years ago, I had a second job, and my basic income was six figures, but I still had a part-time job.
Some people think, oh, if I can make just this amount, then I'll be set and good. You're not set and good if you're in debt. You're not set and good if you owe people money. You're not set and good. I don't care what your income is. It all depends on what your outgo is. Right? And Bridget and I, we had a great living, a nice living. But there were some toys and some things that I wanted. We just moved back to Louisiana and I wanted a four-wheeler. Get all my redneck out of me in the right way. Right? And it didn't matter. She had a great job. I had a great job. But our budget and our household stuff was set in a certain way so that my retirement was set, our savings was set, all of this was set. And so I went and started a little company and started making extra money and bought myself an ATV with a second job. What did that mean? That means I gave up Saturdays. That means I gave up some evenings. Right? Well, pastor, I want to be involved in, in ministry. Yeah, I was. we were couples pastor of a church of about 500, 600. So we were couples pastor. I worked a full-time job that caused me to travel, and I had a part-time gig. So here you go. You have a real hard time getting sympathy from a pastor. When I've done that not too many years ago, and somebody says, well, I'm, I'm stressed out financially. Okay, how many jobs you got? If you don't have at least two or three, Here's the thing. You can't do that long term. I didn't work that out for five years. No. But you know what? You can do a lot of stuff for 12 months. Your body can put up with a whole lot for 12 months. Maybe even six months. You know? As Dave Ramsey says, if you live like nobody else, later you can live like no one else. If you're willing to just pay it up front and willing to pay the price and work hard and do some do some hard things, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Some people are sitting there right now saying, we're going to watch this. Well, Pastor, it's all good to talk about making money and saving money, but you don't have kids. A lot can happen when you got kids. Well, let me tell you something. If I had kids, I'd understand that this whole concept about finances is doubly or triply important. Because I got little ones dependent on me. Right? Again, I, I used to make some horrible decisions with money. So I know what it's like to live broke. I know what it's like to roll credit card debt. Before Bridget and I got married, I would take out credit cards to roll all my credit cards to because I couldn't make the payments that month. So I'd go sign up for a new one and I'd roll the balances over so I'd buy me an extra month. I know what bad decisions are like. I know what being broke is like. I've taken out debt consolidation loans. Yes, debt consolidation loans. I've taken those out before. And guess what? The guy that loan officer that had me sign the paper for him, he literally said, now go home and cut up those cards. Guess what I didn't do? I didn't go home and cut up the card. So guess what? Not too long down the road, I had the debt consolidation note and I had a max out credit card yet again. I've done all this stuff. I've made all these bad mistakes. I used to think that living without debt was a pipe dream. That was just something that was just not possible. Few crazy people talked about that, but it wasn't reality. The truth is it's not about their wealth. It's about a lack of discipline in our life. That was my problem. My problem is I didn't have the discipline to live like I needed to live in a lot of areas of my life, but also financially, and that caught up with me time and time again. You know the truth of the matter, you look at the calendar, here we are midway through December, but nothing that anyone went into debt for last Christmas is so wonderful right now. Kids want more. Family wants more. There's an updated version, a newer, better, whatever that you bought last year and are paying interest on still today, but yet there's something newer, better out that your kids or your family, your husband, your wife, or whatever wants. And you're paying interest on something you tried to buy last year. You know, there is an option out there. I, I love this thing that we have now that's getting to be, I think it's putting a, a hurt on the pawn shops. I told you guys before, man, I didn't know what it was like to have a new anything. My dad, my mom and dad shopped everything from a pawn shop. Everything I got was broken, repaired. It's just, wow. 
Uh, Dad, make up some great backstory about who used to own it, make it so interesting. Teach me how to work on some stuff. Work with electronics, I did with the stuff with the motors on. I never learned how to work on anything with a motor on it. But that's the thing is, is it doesn't hurt to go out on Facebook Marketplace and buy something secondhand. Buy something. Do you know these things, if you just feel like you have to have them, these little things right here, you can get them a lot cheaper from somebody that's owned one and wants the latest and greatest model and is selling theirs. Because there's value sinks like a rock. If I were to drop this thing and it falls, that's how fast these value of these things fall. Right? And you can get stuff like that on the marketplace out there on Facebook. I did hit up some pawn shops, just disclosure. I hit up some pawn shops a couple of weeks ago. My dad was in town, that's like his hobby. And they're charging prices at pawn shops. I can buy stuff newer at Best Buy. We looked at some TVs. I'm like, do I not know the prices of things outside of this pawn shop? But anyway, um, but you can negotiate. Do you know you can negotiate in store? If you go in there and you buy retail for something, stop. Tell the guy at Lowe's, listen, I'm going to buy a new washer and dryer and I'm going to go to Home Depot if I don't get at least 15% off. Right. Now, if your sweetheart's like mine, she may want to go sit in the car. <laughs> I'm like, man, this is fun to me. I mean, this is just like a game. Let's just see how much we can get off, you know? I I'll go find a four model that's all scratched up, you know, and I'll get them on bottom dollar. They go, I tell you what, you give me a new one for the same price and we'll, we got a deal right here, right? <laughs> I tell you, they will go for it every time. 10%, that's nothing. 15, 20, now you're getting somewhere. Negotiate, people. Everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable. So we can buy second hand to help us out and also understand that if you got one that's got newer models out, your old one may be working just fine, whatever that is, fill in the blank. And then sometimes we got to stop and realize, can my money be spent better elsewhere? These are just some things to think about. I'm going to give us some more principles when we get ready to wrap up tonight. But here's the thing. You need some tools to manage your money. You need to have a plan. If money is so powerful, money, and we read last week, is, is just, is, is, has so much power and influence in our life, why wouldn't we want to have a strategy how to manage that power in our life? Before you can manage your money or anything else in your life, you have to be able to understand what you have. You have to be able to measure what you have. So for finances, you can measure what you have by something called a budget. That's a bad word in somebody's vocabulary. But I promise it's a good thing. A budget and a, and a, ca and a cash uh, flow chart. Now, a cash flow chart is nothing more than a budget than, with one more column. And I'm going to explain that here in a second. I really wish I had my screens and you could just see how simple this stuff is. But to be able to make any progress with your money, you must know where your money is going. And then you have to be able to make decisions about that and then tell your money where to go next month. Because if you don't tell your money where to go next month, it's going to keep going places you don't want it to go. That's how money works. It's like it's got a life of its own. The only reason I don't carry cash. I'll put 100 bucks in cash in my wallet. And man, I'll turn around and all of a sudden I don't have any cash and I don't have a clue of where that hundred dollars went. But if I got my little card and I swipe my little card, then I go online and go, oh, I spent this here, here, and here. Right? Some people, that little card, it's got that in four letters at the bottom, Visa. And they don't know you gotta pay that back, and they just keep swiping that thing. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. There's another tool we can use when you need to you need to use cash. So when the envelope's empty, you're done. Right? You're done. But anyway, we'll get into that later. Most people are scared of the word budget because they think it's complicated or scary or something that, that is just going to boggle their mind and really is extremely, extremely simple. And to be able to make any progress with our money, to be able to manage our money, one of the tools you have to have is a budget. Now, what is a budget? You get a piece of paper, get a piece of notebook paper, and you draw two lines down it, and so you've got three columns. Or, or if you're a tech guy, open a spreadsheet, right? Whichever, whichever one you like to do. And you got categories of where you spend your money. 
You got housing and utilities. You got food and clothing. You got transportation and personal care, charity or donations, medical and your debt, bills, entertainment, insurance, and the list goes on and on. So at the top of column one, you just write stuff or category or items. And then you list this stuff out. My house note or my rent, my gas, my insurance, my bills, all your stuff, utilities, water, power, electric, whatever. You list all that out. And then you write down the next column, amount. How much you're going to spend each month on that stuff. And this stuff is real simple, right? You look at how much you pay in rent or how much you pay the mortgage company. That tells you what goes in that blank. You look at your receipts from Walmart for the given month and you know how much you spent at Walmart. And so you simply sit down on paper before one dollar comes in next month and you've written out all 15, 20 categories and you've written out how much money you're going to spend in each one of these areas. And make a zero dollar budget. One of the categories will be savings. So make it to where you got no money left at the end of the month. If you've got $10,000 coming in this month, well, you're going to have it out of all spent. And even if that means that $2.64 goes into savings to make it be zero at the end, that's what you do. You have a zero line budget. Give every dollar a name. Tell it where it goes. And then once you've done that, once you've written that down, Make sure that's where the money goes. You've told it on paper, buddy. This is where you're going. And this is where the cash flow chart comes in, that third column. At the end of the month, you go back and make sure that what you told the money to do, you make sure that's what it did. You make sure that the rent, $1,200 a month for rent, you make sure that you paid that and that you didn't pay them more. You didn't pay them less. They'll knock on your door if you pay them less. They're not happy about that, right? So that's all a cash flow chart is, is your budget. You added one more column to it and you went back and you tracked. All right, I said that I was only gonna give the Golden Arches $50 this month. I'm only gonna buy so many Big Macs. I'm gonna spend $50 on the Big Mac store, that's it. So at the end of the month, you go back and look, how many Big Macs did I spend? If you spent more than $50, your money didn't behave. And we all know that money has no life, right? You're the one that didn't behave with the money, right? We, we, we get that. So you have your plan spend and your actual spend. So your category, plan spend, and actual spend. That's all you need. That's the, the tools that you need. And you can do all that. You can make it as fancy. You can go to mint.com. You can go to, Dave Ramsey has his own little website. You can download an app on your phone. You can pull it up on your computer. You can put it on a spreadsheet. Or you can just get real simple and get a number two pencil and a piece of notebook paper. No matter how you do it, it all ends up the same way. And if you say, you know what, I just can't control that little piece of plastic. I keep saying swipe it, now you're putting it in the chip reader. You don't swipe it anymore, you put it in the chip reader. If you can't control the plastic, then you get envelopes. And every one of those line items that you wrote on that piece of paper, groceries, Walmart, gas, and whatever number of dollars you had out there, you put that amount in the envelope in cash. That really helps you, because then when the envelope's empty, and it's the sixth of the month, you're in trouble. If it's the 26th, oh, okay, I can skate four more days. I, I, I filled up my tank of gas, I'm up. Our Americans are off, whatever, right? But the envelope system will help you enforce your budget if you can't do it with a, with a card, put your money in an envelope, label what it's for, put the amount of money you said you're going to spend in there. When that envelope's empty, here's what you got to do. You got to borrow from another envelope. You got to say, all right, if I'm going to eat at the gold marches, I got to take some money out of the grocery one, out of the Walmart one, out of something, and put it over in this one. It makes you think about what all we're talking about here, I'm, and I'm making a big deal out of a very simplistic thing, but what we're trying to get across, we're trying to get across this. You've got to think about what you're doing with your money. You've got to think about it beforehand, and you have to evaluate it afterward. And say, did I plan appropriately? Dave Ramsey's a great guy. I've got one of his books, and you can order them. You can make that on a Christmas list if you're 
if you're in uh, financial stress, then, then that needs to be your one and only Christmas present is uh, financial peace uh, with Dave Ramsey. That would be the best present you could get. He's got seven, stamp, seven steps that Dave Ramsey talks about that are phenomenal. If you're saying, well, I, I'm so in debt and I've never tried to manage my money and I don't know where to start managing my money, he's got seven steps to financial peace that will give you a very simple plan. Step number one, Get $1,000 in your emergency savings account or emergency fund. And somebody said, Pastor, if I had $1,000, I wouldn't be in a financial stream. I know. I know. I know it's like that your, your emergency fund is another Visa card. And everything emergency just gets, has to pay interest on it. I, I know what that's like. But here's the thing. Look around the house. Find things you can sell to get to that $1,000. And when you sell enough stuff that's near and dear to your heart, you'll protect that thousand dollars. I promise. You sell some things, you do what you got to do, you get a thousand dollars sitting in an emergency fund. What does that do? That wards off Murphy and all of his laws. It keeps them out. As soon as you start trying to make headway, stuff starts breaking and stuff starts messing up. But majority of the things that you need to fix and you need to get by, you can do it with $1,000 or less. And then number two, you start paying off your debt using what he calls the debt snowball, meaning that you write down all your debt, how much you owe. You start with the largest at the top or the smallest at the top and the largest at the bottom. And then you start paying, you pay off your smallest one, then you pay off the next smallest, the next smallest, and you take all of your energy on paying off the one smallest day. You make your minimum payments. You say, man, I'm going I'm to knock this. And here's what happens. It inevitably happens. I've listened to, listened to this call-in show for, for, I don't know, years, um, three or four or five years. And, and it's, it's so much so that people call in, I can give them like what Dave's about to say, right? Because it's like 90% of the time. I'm like, oh, listen, you never listen to Dave. I'm telling you right now what he's going to tell you to do. But it's incredible to listen to people that are working this plan and they pay off one debt and all of a sudden it gives you some momentum and some excitement. Like, man, I used to owe these people some money. And maybe I only owe these people 300 bucks. Maybe not a whole lot. Right? And the next person I owe 600. I just paid off Mr. 300. I'm excited. This is possible. I can get out of debt. Then you take all the money that you were paying Mr. 300 and you put that in addition to what you pay on Mr. 600 and you pay him off. Or her off. And then you work this thing up to the largest debt that you have. And he says, if you can't pay something off in 18 to 24 months, sell it. Sell it if it's possible. Sell it and replace it with something cheaper. Usually cars fall in that category. And when you're working this and you see this snowball roll, it gives you excitement, energy. Until you get the last one, most people, your largest debt is your mortgage. So once you've got everything paid off except your mortgage, you move to step number three, and that is you take that $1,000, you take all that money you've been paying to, 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 to people that you owe, and you start putting that into savings, and you get a savings account that's three to six months your expenses. So if you have a budget thing, and you figured out how much it costs you to live, it costs you $5,000 a month to live, then you need to have fifteen dollars to $30,000 sitting in a savings account as a buffer. Because if you lose a job, you need to have some, some time to buy, to be able to find a new job, right? If all your income goes away. Step number four, once you've got the three to six months, is you begin to invest 50, at least 15% of your household income into retirement plans, Roth IRAs and, or, or regular IRAs or whatever you prefer, annuities or whatever. That's a whole other lesson. Step number five, you start a college fund. If you have kids, so that your kids can go to college. Step number six, then you start packing that mortgage, paying off that mortgage. Step number seven, when you paid off that mortgage, you can really start building wealth. You can start investing. You can start giving more to people around you. You can do all kinds of incredible things. You can go get an investment person to help you make a great plan to retire early and buy that beach house and wherever you want to buy it or whatever, right? Or that mountain cabin or whatever you want to do. The whole thing is you want to be able to manage your money. You need some tools and steps to how to, how to get there. 
See, I'm not the wealthiest guy in the world, probably the wealthiest guy in this room. But Bridget and I are debt free because of decisions that we've made. Except our house. We are debt free. We moved to Dallas in 2004. And at that point, I had a job making double what I was making in Louisiana. And all man, it was tempting. When your income doubles, you're like, man, what a blessing. Let me go out and buy this brand new ride. Let me go out and get this brand new whatever. But do you know that when we doubled our income in 2004, I was driving an eight-year-old car, or she was driving an eight-year-old car, and the other, the other one I was driving a 10-year-old vehicle. And do you know that we continued to drive those vehicles? Well, Pastor, you doubled your income. I did. But I realized and knew that this was an opportunity to change our future. And if we would make some smart decisions with a blessing right now, then we, we could be set later in life. And so we didn't run out and, and blow and sign up for all kind of bills to take care of that blessing that we had received in income. We qualified for a mortgage. The bank said we could borrow double what we borrowed for a house. You know, just because the mortgage company says you can borrow it doesn't mean you need to. The banker's job is to loan you all the money they can to get all the interest they can, right? The banker is not your financial advisor. When it, the loan officer is not your financial advisor. Okay? There's been times in our life where we've delayed purchases simply because we wanted to make sure we kept the big picture in mind. We want to play the long game financially. Here's the thing tonight, and I don't have much longer. We can keep doing what you're doing, and in three to five years, you'll be right where you're at right now. Or you can make some changes in behavior, some smart decisions, or even some hard decisions, and put yourself and your family in a better place in three to five years. And I don't know about you guys, but the older I get, the quicker three to five years goes by. Right? Bridget and I, both of our families have come from humble beginnings. Like I said earlier, I've, I've lived broke. My family at one point when I was in school, we were on subsidized lunches and assistance. That's not a place where you hang out and live. It's a place to get you to a better place. But here's the thing, you have to change your behavior in order to change your circumstances. And when you start making right choices with money, blessings always follow, your, follow that path. God will always honor the choices you make that are right with money. Other people will honor it. Because when you start listening to people like Dave Ramsey, you start reading books like that, one of his phrases that he uses when people ask him how he's doing, he says, better than I deserve. And all the Dave Ramsey listeners know this. And, and you'll hear people call into his show sometimes and they'll say that they'll be in a restaurant and, and a waiter will come up. And they'll ask the waiter or waitress, well, how are you doing? They'll say, better than I deserve. And they'll just look at him and say, this job number two or three. And they'll have a conversation. And the person that recognizes that is usually in a good place. And so I have heard multiple times over that person that, that received that answer from that waiter or waitress would leave a $100 tip or a $200 tip. Because I know this person is this person's working a financial plan. It's working, it's working a financial plan, reading some books, and, and I'm just going to bless them. So make a budget and make a plan to get out of debt. There's peace of mind that comes with good stewardship and godly principles. I'm not talking about just a pursuit of wealth, trying to get wealthy, trying to get rich. Talk about giving you a peace. Can you imagine if you went to bed tonight and you had zero worry about your bills, about your money, about who you owed, there was no creditors or debtors calling? Could you imagine the kind of peace you would have? As we as I start to wind down tonight, let me give you six good principles Bridget and I live by that again are based in some Dave Ramsey and other financial planning. No matter what at all costs, I try hard to avoid borrowing money outside of a, a, a house. And when you borrow money for a house, you don't do the bare minimum 3% to 
special loan deal of the month just to get a mortgage. If you don't put down at least 10, you're going to pay PMI, which is mortgage insurance. It does you no good. It's a whole other lesson, but, but understand that. Read, read about that. Put down that 20, 30, 40, 50% on a house if you can. Before you do anything, before you sign a note for anything, ask yourself, is this what I'm about to sign worth becoming a slave over? Well, Pastor, that's stout words where the scripture says that the borrower is slave to the lender. So that brand new TV that you're going to go put on a, a, a three year 0% interest, you're now a slave to Best Buy or whoever it is you're signing up for. And stop and go, is the TV worth becoming a slave over? Number two, no matter what, I give more than a tenth of my income to my local church. Scriptures, I'm kind of going to tie it. I'll mention this next week. Just a small part next week. But I'll mention next week about giving, about tithe. But I don't want to do the bare minimum. I want my financial place to be where I can give more than, than the bare minimum. No way, man, on that one. That's okay. Number three, no matter what, I have an emergency fund of at least three to six months of expenses. No matter what, we don't spend over a certain amount in our household without talking to one another. I'm not going to go out and buy a brand new car without my sweetheart knowing it. A dozen roses don't get you over that one. <laughs> Promise you. Right? I'm not going to go out and spend four or five, six, seven hundred dollars without making a phone call or without having a conversation. And then we make it a point, try hard. Dave Ramsey recommends you never have over 25% of your annual income invested in things that have motors in them. Cars, boats, ATVs, because guess what? All those things lose or drop in value. You want to put your money in things that increase in value. And again, always buy second hand or second generation when you can. And you know how much money you can say, you know what this is right here? My wife and I, we're, we're blessed. So we don't, we, we've made some smart decisions. But this is an iPhone 8. Do you know what iPhone they're on right now? Like 22 or something, I don't know. I think it's like, a, like an X, XR, XS, and a, they started using Roman noodles. I got all confused, right? This has still got the button at the bottom. They don't even have buttons on them. I hadn't had buttons on them in like two generations. But you know what? This thing works. It does everything I need it to do. I'm not anxious to give, give somebody $1,000 for another one of these things. I'm not anxious to do that. Dave Ramsey says winning at money, and I'm wrapping up. Winning at money is 80% behavior and 20% head knowledge. People think, well, if I just knew the secrets of how to get wealthy, if I knew the secrets to, to, to rich people, if I had their secrets, it's not about the secrets and about the knowledge. It's about discipline. It's about behavior. It's about commitment. Amen. Let's everybody stand tonight. I read this and I thought it was really good. Speaking that, considering that 80% of our money issues boil down to our behaviors, there are six things that rich people do. They have affordable housing. They don't try to look rich. They get stuff done today. They don't watch TV or watch very little. Instead, they read. They always go above and beyond, and they're disciplined. Disciplined. It boils down to our behavior and our self-discipline. Our willing to delay gratification and say, you know what, that's... All oh, looks good, sounds good, smells good, but, but I'm going to wait on that until i got some money. Now listen, if you've got the money to do it, here's the thing. I talked about this last week. We do three things with money. We spend it, we save it, we give it. And we've got to be able to enjoy money. Sometimes we go out, Bridget and I, we'll go to a, a really nice restaurant and pay way too much for a meal. But you know what? We enjoy doing that. And, and, and you, you want to be able to go buy something nice sometimes and, and do some nice things and enjoy the blessings you have of God. But we don't go in debt to do that. That's a big difference. Some people want to go out and just lavish living and every time they, they, they make a decision to do that, they're swiping a card in there but with somebody interest. We don't want to do that. Next week we'll wrap up about, about money. 
And I'll talk a little bit about the giving. And I've got probably more stories than you've got time. But we'll talk about a little bit about investing money. And here's the thing, church. It's You guys, this church as a whole blows the doors off all of the industry averages in giving and, and, and good stewards. And, and my whole point in this series is not to try to get you to give more money to this church. But I want you to have the peace of mind that comes along with being in a good financial position. Amen. I want you to live like nobody else the way that you can live like nobody else. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your goodness and your mercy. I thank you for your many blessings. And, and God, your word tells us your opinion about money and your word tells us what we should do with it. And I pray right now, God, that you give us a strength and a desire and a help to make wise decisions with one of the most powerful things that we'll ever come in contact with. Help us, God, to be satisfied in you, to find contentment in you and not in material possessions. <clears throat> give us a desire, God, to have a peace that comes with using wisdom in our finances. I thank you for each person here. Put your hand upon us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. And let everything we do in our life bring you glory and bring you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love each and every one of you. Have a great Wednesday night. We'll see you Sunday.